Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. One of Korea's most successful exports is Taekwondo, a martial art practiced by tens of millions around the globe and recognized as an Olympic sport since the 2000 Summer Games in Sydney. Yet, far from being united, the world of Taekwondo has suffered various schism. The story of its founder is as disputed as it is marred in the politics of the Korean Peninsula. And as a discipline, Taekwondo is represented by two competing organizations on the international stage. To learn more about the history of Taekwondo and the life story of its founding father, General Choi Hong-hee, we had the honor of interviewing Dr. George Vitali. He kindly offered to guide us through the complex politics of Taekwondo, the endeavors of General Choi, and, of course, the distinctive aspects of this modern martial art. Senior Master George Vitali holds an 8th Dan, the second highest rank, in Taekwondo, and was inducted into the official Taekwondo Hall of Fame in 2009 for his lifetime achievements, which include bringing a team of North Korean athletes to tour the United States. He has also received his honorary doctorate degree in Taekwondo from North Korea in 2011. He previously served as head of the security detail for two New York State governors. Dr. George Vitelli, welcome to Korea and the World. Thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I eagerly look forward to telling your listeners about the great gift of Taekwondo. It truly is Korea's greatest gift to the world. Untold millions around the world have had their lives positively impacted with their participation in Taekwondo. You have a long history with Taekwondo. How were you first introduced to this discipline? And what do you see as the milestones of your Taekwondo career? Growing up back in New York City, maybe every American boy in, in, in our big metropolitan city would grow up with their father telling them, you know, keep their dukes up, you know, keep your hands up as uh, we learned some form of boxing, usually from our dads at first. And then I was exposed to it on a local level in the local sports clubs. And then when I was in high school, I fell in love with wrestling. And one of my older brothers, Dennis, him and his friend were involved in Tang Sudo. And they briefly introduced me to it with some basic techniques. And I had a fascination with it. Now, this is back in the, in the early 70s, late 60s. And at that time, these Eastern fighting arts were making their way to the West. And it was a really great craze at the time. You had the Bruce Lee movies, the Billy Jack movies, Kung Fu TV series. So it seemed like every young Western male looked at this, what we seen as this new way to fight and protect ourselves that was also mixed in with this philosophy of softness that was very, very appealing to the West. So I, I think that's what piqued my interest. And, on a, and it was a Monday, I think, we were coming home from school, and my friend Eduardo Rodriguez asked me, what you do this weekend? So I told him, oh, I went to see this really great Billy Jack movie. I wish I could do the things that that guy did. And Eduardo said to me, well, why don't you train? I said, I wouldn't have a clue of where to begin. And he said, why don't you go where I go? And Eduardo had these two gigantic knuckles on his right fist. And we used to ask him, why do you have such big knuckles? And he said, I get nervous and I chew on them because he tried to keep it quiet, his involvement in the martial arts. And we believed that because he had a very, very serious stuttering problem. And I, I was with Eduardo in high school. We also went to grammar school together. And you know how kids are sometimes when other children have these kind of uh, problems, they often look to make fun of them. So we would sit in the classroom and everybody read a paragraph and everybody waited till Eduardo got to read his paragraph. And sadly, people would poke fun at that. So I believed him when he said that his knuckles were big, not from the conditioning in the martial arts, but because he was nervous and he chewed on them. So it was a short time after that, I went up to the school where he trained. My instructor, Kim Kwang Sung, was my subonym, my and he was from Gwangju, Korea. And he, in essence, became a very important adult role model, a father figure in my life. So that's how I started. And obviously, some of the milestones would be when my teacher thought I was trained long and hard enough to have earned the black belt. And I remember the night he called me into his office. And the, it was a Monday after the promotion test was on that Saturday. 
and he told me take off my red belt he threw the red belt in the trash bin and he tied the black belt around me and I was uh, thrilled that was probably the first milestone that I ever remembered and he was the one that told me having a black belt certificate signed by General Choi Hung Hee was like having an invitation to come to America by Christopher Columbus so that was one of the first milestones. Uh, then, of course, another milestone was uh, several years later, about a decade later, I had the first opportunity to actually train on the General Troy. And it was then that I realized how much I didn't know. The man was brilliant. His answers, his explanations, they left you stunned. I remember having my jaw drop and saying, why didn't I think of that? How come I didn't realize that? Geez, it makes such sense what he's saying. Why didn't I know I was even lacking in that area? A year or two later, I completed my first international instructors course with the ITF, and I received my international instructor certification number 404. That meant there was only 403 people in the world that were certified instructors. And then finally, I think the other milestone would be when I earned a doctorate in sports science with the Taekwondo-related studies from North Korea. Imagine that, an American earning a academic PhD from North Korea. And then the last thing I'll, I'll add in that I thought about was in Tashkent, Uzbekistan, at the Congress, the ITF Congress, that's the world meeting body of delegates from all around the planet that are official members of the ITF. Professor Chang Ung, then the ITF president, added an item to the official agenda, and it was my birthday, and everybody stood up, wished me happy birthday, a clap, and they sang happy birthday to me. It was a nice cake afterwards, but uh, that was another thing. Can you imagine a man from North Korea signaling out his American friend at this international gathering and have everybody sing happy birthday to me? So those are some of the milestones, and that's how I had gotten involved in one of the greatest impacts of, of my life. You just mentioned that you have a doctorate from North Korea. How did that come about and why, out of all countries, you chose to do a doctorate in North Korea? Why not North Korea? <laughs> 2007, the ITF, the International Taekwondo Federation, at their congress in Slovenia, announced the start of a new program for a PhD. And, of course, I was really intrigued by it. I was the first one to sign up for it. And it wasn't really through North Korea. It was through this international organization, the ITF. And it had branches of support in countries like Australia and India. What they did was establish a connection where Pyongyang... See, the government in, in the northern part of Korea... I have come to understand that all their university college degrees are issued through what they call the State Commission on Academic Degrees and Titles. So the program they put through was upon my fulfillment of my obligations, the degree was actually conferred by their vice premier in their national assembly. And as I said, why not North Korea? But in my case, imagine convincing the establishment in Pyongyang of what the real history of Taekwondo is. And as you will see, the real history of Taekwondo brings us back to where? The South Korean Army, the Army of South Korea, the Rock Army, where you know people in the North look at that entity as a puppet of my host American government. So I said, if I can get the DPRK to accept the truth about the real history of Taekwondo, which, by the way, is that they completely adopted this rock military Taekwondo, the original Taekwondo, and they today are the vanguards of this original Taekwondo. How then can the South Korean government keep ignoring the facts about the real history of Taekwondo? We know that the WTF, located in Seoul, is the Olympic International Federation for the martial sport of Taekwondo. They have 206 member countries. North Korea is not a member country of the WTF. So we can safely assume that if you do basic math, 206 plus 1 is 207. So we can safely assume that at least 207 countries do Taekwondo around the world. That's more countries than are members of the United Nations. And I tell people all the time. In 206 countries around the world, people know the real history of Taekwondo. Only one country does not acknowledge, does not know, does not teach the real history of Taekwondo. Not North Korea, what some people consider or call the Hermit Kingdom, but South Korea. 
uh, South Korea is today a vibrant, thriving, rich democracy, so very well connected with the internet and this kind of technology that there's no reason in 2016, the 21st century, that one of the most connected countries in the world does not know the real history of their greatest gift to the world. So I said, well, if I can convince this panel of 15 professors in North Korea after I submitted my dissertation and they translated it, if I can convince them of the real history of Taekwondo, how can anybody anywhere else in the world deny the truth? Taekwondo is generally considered a martial art. Allow me to ask naively, is Taekwondo, therefore, essentially a set of techniques to beat up people? Yes, of course it is. If not, how can we consider it a martial art? A martial art, after all, is comprised of techniques to beat people up. But if you didn't have that capability, I don't think it would be a martial art. But then we have to think about the next logical question. Why are we beating people up? And who is it? Who are these people that we're beating up? And then I guess it, it's worth taking a brief look back historically on what the purposes of martial arts were. Why did people study martial arts? And it always was something related to the militaries of certain areas in protection of what their areas had accomplished and had acquired. And as the advances in weaponry developed, along with that development came new methods of warfare, especially when gunpowder was introduced. So martial arts of what was in the past historically has kind of faded away. And then it was in the 1880s when a Dr. Jukuro Kano, who was also a member of the IOC and uh, had a doctorate in education, I believe, introduced a new art. He developed judo, which I believe comes from jujitsu and he introduced it into the Japanese school system. And he did it for the purpose, uh, ma many purposes, but in particular physical education and the well-being of these young Japanese school students. So for General Choi, it was simple. What did he want to do? He wanted to build strong physical students and arm them with self-defense techniques so they can stand on the side of justice at all times. So students of Taekwondo will not fail to take action when it will benefit society. You know, we, we have an oath. There's a student oath that General Choi wrote, and it's recited at the beginning of each class. I shall observe the tenets of Taekwondo. I shall never misuse Taekwondo. I shall respect my instructors and seniors. I shall be a champion of freedom and justice. I shall build a more peaceful world. So, yes, martial arts is about battle, but martial arts in the 20th century had the added component of this character development where it looked to make this martial art and the capabilities for the purposes of defending oneself or innocent people. Is there a specific meaning to the word Taekwondo? Uh, yes, there is a very specific meaning for the word Taekwondo. The three characters that comprise the term Taekwondo will have a different meaning for different people. But the man who conceived the name, General Choi Hung Hee, used his extensive knowledge of Chinese characters that is required when you're a calligraphy artist to the extent that he was, and he had an in-depth knowledge of the Chinese classics. So the first character, Te, is what some people say foot, but it's not. It's an actual elevated foot. So if you ask Chinese people to read the character, they will somehow describe a foot elevated off the floor. That can indicate kicking, jumping, flying, or smashing. Quan was actually in use with Quan Bup as a fist. And what is a fist? It's a hand that's rolled in to a fist, which denotes strength. And it was a reason why General Choi decided on that character in contrast to the character for hand, which is Su. It was because he wanted to denote strength. Prior to Taekwondo being officially named and the training regiment to be developed, General Choi formed the 29th Infantry Division, and he used his fist to be on an emblem of the Korean Peninsula. And the division nickname was the Fist Division. So that's what the two characters are. And then the Do, people will translate as the Way, or the spiritual side, or the non-physical side. But the character actually is Dao, which comes from Taoism. And Taoism has a, a strict adherence to a certain code of moral and ethical behavior. So that's what the actual name Taekwondo means. 
Taekwondo is said to have also a spiritual component, and that peace, both in the sense of inner peace as well as physical peace, plays an important role. Could you elaborate on that? Certainly. But before I elaborate, I would make a clear distinction. I prefer physical and non-physical side of Taekwondo as compared to spiritual side. Various students can have their own personal belief systems, and what defines the non-physical side, at least for ITF Taekwondo, is centered around of five tenets. Courtesy, Iui. Integrity, Yamchi. Perseverance, Inne. Self-control, Guki. Indomitable spirit, Bekchul Bulgul. These tenets were not created by General Choi. These are time-honored principles that he listed and put in his regiment, in his system of Taekwondo that he was developing. And as you can see, what parent, what religion, what community would not want to embrace these generic principles? Truly, they enhance one's lives. Additionally, on the physical side, the intense training is very healthy, as all forms of physical exercise are healthy. They say physical activity releases endorphins, and when we strive to kick harder, faster, higher, when we strive to break that brick, to memorize movements of these intricate patterns that we call tul, other people call pumse or forms, that's very demanding. And over a period of time, when you strive to complete what in the beginning may be seemingly unsurmountable obstacles, but through constant repetition, through diligent training, by real hard effort, you see you can do these things. They are not impossible. They not, are not superhuman. We can do them if we are willing to put in the required amount of work. And that lesson eventually switches over for people to realize, hey, not only do I do this in martial art training with my Taekwondo, but if I do this in my personal life, whether I have a project as a student child, homework assignment, a term paper, a thesis, a dissertation, a particular challenging examination that's coming up, or you apply these traits to your relationships with people, whether they be other family members, uh, romantic involvement, your neighbors, other members of the community, your coworkers, even your boss, or as a employee. It just is the essence of what real martial art is about. So when you train these techniques, you also come up with an inner confidence. And with that confidence, no longer comes the need to prove yourself because you do know what you're capable of. So for many people or some people, there is some, they say, spiritual aspect because they don't really know how to define it. General Trade defined it very clearly. Courtesy, integrity, self-control, perseverance, indomitable spirit. That's the essence in ITF Taekwondo with the Do, the way. It is a way to a better life. And how is it a way to a better life? Adhering to these time-honored principles that every parent, every member of society, if they adhered to, would make society better for everyone and would, in its own way, contribute to a more peaceful world. How does Taekwondo differ from other popular martial arts, such as Karate from Japan or Kung Fu from China? Most students of martial arts would see a difference in karate as compared to Kung Fu or as compared to Japan. Other people will look and say they're kicking and punching in some type of pajamas, so they're all doing the same thing. My own mother, if she was to have the TV on and see some kung fu practitioner with some nice graceful flowing movement in his uh, satin type of uniform would say oh that's what my little georgie does and i guess yes i do some movements i don't know if people would say they're flowing or graceful but i do do them in these pajama type looking clothing and a front kick is a front kick a punch is a punch when it all boils down to it now somebody like general Choi would define a front kick and he would define it differently. There are many types of front kicks. For instance, a front snap kick. And with his front snap kick, you could use your knee. You could use your toes. You could use your instep. But the primary tool for a front snap kick would be the ball of the foot. But depending on what areas of the body you are going to strike with this kick would determine the attacking tool. 
And he was very scientific in his approach where he would look at the human anatomy and divide it up into different sections and identify the vital spots and then further would list and identify parts of one's body that are most efficient at attacking these vital systems. So Kung Fu sometimes can be very flowing. That could be considered a soft style. Uh, something like judo, jujitsu, would be more like a wrestling or a grappling where there's a lot of close combat uh, like wrestling. So there are different emphases that different or various martial arts have that separate them. But when it comes down in the end, the punch is pretty much a punch. And uh, taekwondo would be considered what many people would categorize as a standing art. So in, in other words, we're not looking primarily to grapple, and it's a stand and, and strike type of art. And also, these arts can have their own philosophy. Uh, we discuss General Choi's philosophy. That very much comes from his upbringing in Korea and with the Korean customs and whatnot. So we can say naturally that each of these other countries, Japan and China, have had their own cultural influences on their martial arts. But as military martial arts died out with the rise in gunpowder, the, the way I, I try to think it's good to illustrate this point is 300 years ago, 200 years ago, 1,500 years ago, there were not strip malls that had storefront dojangs in them or dojos in them that were teaching martial arts to commercial students. They were limited to the military. It wasn't until the 1880s and then Funakoshi Sensei, who is the founder of Shotokan Karate introduced karate to the school system in mainland Japan when he relocated there from Okinawa. Prior to this time, martial arts had really faded away other than something that you would learn from a neighbor or your father, like I did with my father telling me, keep my hands up to protect myself. It was the 1880s and then the 1920s that started to bring the move of civilianized martial arts to the general community. So one particular martial art might emphasize, may allow them to stand apart, but at the end, they do have a lot in common. So today when we think of Taekwondo, many people will think about Olympic Taekwondo, and Olympic Taekwondo is known for a specific set of rules that you must compete under. Once you have determined what the rules are, people use innovation, they put their minds to work, and they come up with techniques that will work within those settings. So today, many people, when they think of Taekwondo, will see people in a white-colored dobak, and they will be wearing a chest protector, a headgear, and the emphasis will be on kicking with power for a knockout or kicking to these chest protectors or the head where certain points would register and either winning by knockout or winning by points. Hand techniques are limited to the chest only, so there are a far fewer hand techniques in, say, the WTF Olympic-style Taekwondo as compared to the ITF Taekwondo or to Kung Fu or to Karate. Karate, on the same hand, was not known historically for the use of the feet and the legs. So you'll see differences like that, but when it all settles down, a front kick is a front kick and a punch is a punch. So there is a tremendous amount of overlap. And that's why many, many martial artists will have this camaraderie with one another. It's just in the case of Taekwondo because of all the political infighting that's happened in the past over the development, there is this schism. But martial artists usually always share this camaraderie of cross-training and have an affinity towards one another because in the end, they have more in common than it sets them apart. Before going any further, two terms that come up frequently when talking about Taekwondo is WTF and ITF. What do those acronyms mean? ITF stands for International Taekwondo Federation. WTF stands for World Taekwondo Federation. The ITF was formed in Seoul, Korea at the Chosun Hotel, the Rose Room of the Chosun Hotel, March 22, 1966. The World Taekwondo Federation, WTF, was formed in the Kukiwan at the end of May 1973, when uh, the Korean Taekwondo Association, the KTA, hosted the first World Championships of Taekwondo. Korea itself has a number of other martial arts uh, which are still practiced. For example, there's Shiram, which is better known as Korean wrestling, and Hapkido. How do these relate to Taekwondo? Martial arts 
do have an awful lot of overlap. There is a lot in common with one another. I personally like to look at Hapkido as a cousin to Taekwondo. But when we look at the history of how Taekwondo developed, it started in the Rock Army. And it actually began as an MMA, mixed martial arts, but a mix, a mix of the martial arts that were available to these soldiers at that place and time in history. So Grandmaster Choi Chang Kyung, known as C.K. Choi, who lives in Vancouver, British Columbia, pioneer, he likes to call it a consolidated martial art. And he was one of these pioneers that was actually there in those early days in the Otakwan when they started putting Taekwondo together. And he, along with other pioneers, would say they all had various levels of experience and exposure to these other martial arts, and they incorporated things that worked, and they eliminated things that were not as effective. So Taekwondo, as a martial art, has a formal category that we call Hosensu, which is literally a way to protect yourself. And many Hapkido techniques have been incorporated into Taekwondo in this formal category of, of Hosensu because it gives additional options to defend yourself. Of course, if somebody grabs you, casts you, you have the ability to attack back, counterattack, block and attack or counter. But not all the time you might not want to do that. As a police officer, I wanted to, and by law, it was required to sometimes not fight back and attack, but to subdue. So you want to be able to manipulate joints to have people comply with you. So a Hapkido has entered into Taekwondo because it was this consolidation early on. And uh, that's why I like to look at it as a cousin. And wrestling, Korean wrestling, has been around for a very long time, and I think that is part of this, I would say, myth that Taekwondo is 2,000 years old. There is a lot of propaganda going around about Taekwondo's history, and the Korean wrestling mixes into that formula because Korea very rightfully wants to point out the fact that they did indeed have these traditional fighting arts a long time ago. A long time ago, quite specifically, pre-occupation. So Korean wrestling is used to highlight that fact, which is very important to Koreans because they want to make this bridge back from today past the 20th century, bypassing the whole Japanese connection to go back in time when Korea had naturally, like other places around the world, had organized systems of fighting. So it goes back to that premise or concept, the 206 countries of WTF and then North Korea and South Korea still adhering to this false narrative. So yes, Korea did and does have these indigenous fighting arts. They do have a very long and proud history as an intact culture that dates some 5,000 years. But Korean wrestling and Hapkido, while things may have been incorporated into Taekwondo, they are separate entities. As you mentioned, Taekwondo today is an Olympic discipline. Is the taekwondo performed there, so to speak, real, actual taekwondo? Or is it rather a version that has been diffused only for the purpose of friendly competition? No, of course WTF taekwondo or Olympic taekwondo is actual taekwondo. It is real taekwondo. Some people will even say that that is the true traditional taekwondo. So this is a very important question. And one that I'm glad you asked, and I'm very happy to address. Taekwondo's history is very confusing for a myriad of reasons. So it's helpful if the listener can understand that there are more than one way to look at what Taekwondo is, and there are actually more than one style, system, branch of Taekwondo. So yes, Olympic Taekwondo is actual or real Taekwondo. And I would like to clarify that Taekwondo was first recognized by the International Olympic Committee in 1980. And then when Seoul hosted the Olympics in 1988, it was a demonstration sport. If anybody knows anything about IOC rules and protocols, demonstration sport can appear only once. But Taekwondo appeared in 1992 in Barcelona, Spain as a demonstration sport. Well, how can that be? How can it be in the Olympics as a demonstration sport twice? Well, Dr. Kim Won-young, the founding president of WTF, who made it up to vice president in IOC, very powerful man in the international sports scene, and 
who deserves to be recognized as the father of Olympic Taekwondo, actually sold a proposal to Juan Samaranch, the IOC president at the time, to have a scaled-down version of a demonstration sport and call it an exhibition sport. But it did become official Olympic sport in 2000. And an important date, September 4th, 1994, is when the IOC gave Taekwondo its official sports status. So that that accomplishment was a real miracle. It was done in record time. It is the only second Asian sport in history to be incorporated officially into the Olympic program. Taekwondo today, in many places, especially in affluent countries in the West, have become a kiddie activity, almost like a babysitting service for children or child rearing, like daycare, where it's martial discipline or one of the derogatory terms is take my dough. Contrary to what one might expect, the history of Taekwondo has a fairly recent starting point. When did Taekwondo as a distinct martial art appear? Again, there is no easy answer because we first have to define what we mean by distinct. So the simple answer is easy, 1955, because that's when the name was conceived and approved by the first president of Korea, Dr. Sigmund Rhee. So that's when the name was applied to this new entity they were in the process of developing in the mid-50s in the South Korean army. But when did it actually become its own distinct martial art is open to interpretation by various people. Because back in the early days, quite honestly, it's the essential truth is that it was all just basic karate with some minor Chinese martial art influence. Even the names were karate-based, Karate Link, Karate Connected. Kang Sudo is the way that you would pronounce the characters in Korean for karate. Tang Sudo was when China Hand was a change to Empty Hand, so Tang Sudo was going back to China Hand, Tang being the Tang Dynasty in China. The developmental process began in the 1950s, and I agree with the conclusion of Dr. Kim Hee Young. He's a historian, PhD in history, but he's also a Korean pioneer grandmaster. And he says that WTF Taekwondo became distinctly Korean in the 1970s when the competition rules spurred the third generation to think about the kicking for points and fighting in points where it used to be somebody kicked, I blocked and counted. So now the person is in the, in motion, in mid-motion of attacking. And instead of me, the opponent blocking, I immediately would take advantage of their vulnerability in mid-motion and I would counter kick them. So that's when he lists WTF coming into its own as a distinct Korean Taekwondo. Then he also, and I concur with this finding, he believes ITF Taekwondo became a distinctly Korean Taekwondo or its own martial art in the 1980s. That's when General Choi finalized his 24th toll, his patterns, and applied the unique movement that no other martial art uses when they perform these patterns. So again, these are just the concepts that people agree or disagree with. The actual start is in the 50s when Taekwondo was named, but that developmental process took time. Blunt as this question may be, why would anyone develop a technique for unarmed man-to-man combat in an age with machine guns, tanks, and submarines? General Choi would say that he saw so much death and destruction, so much misery, First, when they suffered the degradation of the long-term brutal occupation by Imperial Japan during the colonial days that many Koreans called the dark period, and then a devastating civil war. So when he devised his taekwondo, he made it clear it was turning the body into a weapon and rejecting the use of weapons because many other martial arts incorporate weapons into their training. He made a conscious decision not to because he seen so much death and destruction and suffering. You know, we're sitting here in Korea, how many miles south of the DMZ, the most heavily fortified border in the world, do we actually need more weapons? So martial art and martial art techniques are not taught separately. They're taught under the umbrella of this strict discipline that requires adherence to a specific type of moral conduct designed to build sound moral character in the students. 
Does the emergence of Taekwondo stand in a longer tradition of unarmed combat techniques from Korean history? I think the best way for me to answer this is I just counted down five seconds. Probably the worst thing that can happen to an audio interview, radio talk, is dead air silence. Uh, the reason I did that is to dramatize there are none, no connection from today's Taekwondo to any martial art indigenous to Korea from a time long gone. None whatsoever. That doesn't mean that they weren't doing some type of front kick or punching back in Korea a long time ago, because I'm sure they were. But we don't have to waste any time pursuing a connection that is not there. Koreans went to Japan during the occupation and were exposed to karate. So yes, Korea has a proud history that we can trace back to some 5,000 years in some instances. And as we said before, fighting systems automatically can quite naturally have overlap. But there is just no verifiable connection. Uh, they have looked at this very, very closely. Scholars have been examining the record. And if they could find some connection, believe you me, that connection would be highlighted front and center because for national purposes, it's very, very important. One of the most important and arguably the most controversial figure in the history of Taekwondo is Choi Hong-hee, whom you have been referring to as General Choi. Who was he and what was his role in the development of Taekwondo? Simply put, he is the man, the person, that without, there would be no Taekwondo. We would not be having this discussion. Your followers would not be tuning in to learn about this because without General Choi, there is no Taekwondo. See, I, I reject the, the label of him as controversial because that's a label given to him by his detractors. Getting to who he was, he was someone that was born in physically the northern part of a unified Korea during Japanese colonial rule. He was very adept, very talented with his hand, uh, with calligraphy. And he would come on later on to win some awards. And for people that have a calligraphy, it's a very, very prized possession to have a calligraphy written by General Choi. And his family was able to send him to Japan to pursue higher education. When he was there, he was exposed to karate. When he came home during a break, the war, the Second World War was going very bad. Japan was uh, pressured to grab any able-bodied Korean male to support the war effort. So General Choi, like many other Koreans, was forcefully conscripted through no choice of his own into service in the Japanese Imperial Army. And what did he do? Well, he was actually implicated as a leader in a student soldier's revolt against the colonial government. But a Korean collaborator exposed them, and General Choi, a couple other leaders, and members of this movement were incarcerated. And there's some question that he was going to be executed. But regardless of that, August 15, 1945, when Japan unconditionally surrendered, ending World War II, it ended the occupation. And General Choi was spared, released from prison, and he moved south, and he joined the growing democracy movement in Seoul. A short time after, in January of 1946, he enrolled in the first South Korean military academy. And when he graduated as a, he was commissioned a second lieutenant upon graduation, he was actually one of the founding members of the Korean army. By that I mean he was number 44, serial number 44, of 110 initial candidates. So he graduated from that initial class, was stationed in Gwangju, there, as a young company commander, he started teaching the martial arts that he learned to the soldiers under his command because, quite honestly, they had nothing. He felt humiliated that he's in the Korean army and they had really no supplies, no real anything. They were even forced to use leftover Japanese army uniforms. So uh, one of the things he did was start teaching the martial arts, which then further enraged him because, well, he learned these martial arts in Japan. So now he's teaching a Japanese-based martial art to his Korean soldiers. And this bothered him, and it helped provide an incentive for him to create or devise or lead the development of a Korean martial art. So he was looked at or considered 
controversial by many of his detractors, mainly because of his political opposition to the military dictatorships in South Korea. That was his personal political outlook. It had nothing to do with Taekwondo, but of course it impacted his ability to be a Taekwondo leader. And he had his own vision for Taekwondo as a leader. That's what he wanted to pursue. Other leaders at the time did not share each and every vision that he did or had different things that they wanted to emphasize. So that created some internal conflict. He was, after all, a general, a founder of the Korean army that rose to two-star major general. And he then was the first Korean ambassador to Malaysia. So here is a general in a developing country we know from examining other examples in history yields an awful lot of power in these developing countries. He then rises to the level of ambassador and introduces Taekwondo to Malaysia. And all along the while, he still continues to conduct himself like he's a general, but now he's out of the military and he's now surrounded by people who were not, all of them were soldiers under his command. So he got a lot of pushback and it created a lot of hard feelings. Even changing the Taesudo name back to his Taekwondo name was highly controversial. And the way that he pressured and pushed to get his way simply upset a lot of the other people. But it wasn't until General Choi became very outspoken of the military dictators and actually backed opposition leaders that his ability to be able to safely stay in Korea was uh, threatened. Later, he introduces Taekwondo to North Korea. But remember, he exiled to Canada, became a Canadian citizen. So he went to North Korea as a Canadian citizen, not as a South Korean. But for South Korean people, I don't think it matters because he was this general. He was an ambassador. And now for him to go and introduce Taekwondo to the enemy, that in many people's minds cemented that he's not just controversial. He is a communist that committed treason, a traitor, by going to North Korea. So I reject that because his motivation going to North Korea was to spread Taekwondo there. And his philosophy was to spread Taekwondo around the world, irregardless of race, religion, creed, political ideology, or national boundaries. Who was he? He was the man that gave the world Taekwondo. Grandmaster Jung Woo Jin from Taekwondo Times Magazine, he calls Choi Hyung Hee the Nelson Mandela of Korea. And General Choi was engaged in working with both halves of Korea, and he used very early on Taekwondo as a soft diplomatic tool to engage the people from North Korea and South Korea and all around the world because it was his fervent belief and his deeply held desire that if more people engaged in the training of Taekwondo, built their moral character, and were able to meet their counterparts from around the world, these better citizens from different places around the world, despite their obviously differences on the surface, would be easily, more easily joined together because of this common shared activity of Taekwondo. And through that, they would get to see your eyes may be structured differently, your skin color may be a different shade than someone else, you may have a different religion, you may dress differently, but in the end, we're all the same, we're human beings, and when we can come to this realization, it's a way that he would help contribute to building more peace of world. And the final pattern that he designed, or not the final pattern design, but the last in a series of 24 patterns in ITF Taekwondo is called Tongil for reunification. And the movements are done along a straight vertical line. The reason the movements are done along that straight vertical line is to symbolize Korean people are one, one bloodline, one language, one culture. So he was a very complex person. In my view, he is a national patriot. He is a national hero. He was not North Korean. He was not South Korean. He was just Korean. So I think in time, history will credit him for his great accomplishments through his work with Taekwondo. And the final thing with what, what he did that was truly unprecedented, he established a global standard. He taught all around the world. And every two years, some 50 to 75 or more countries would show up at this biannual event called the World Championships of ITF Taekwondo. 
And at that world championship venue, the gold medal standard, the winner, the champion, would be the person or persons in the different categories that performed closest to the standard this man personally set. It is truly unprecedented in the annals of martial art history. His impact is global in nature. I often ask people, can you name a Korean whose name has more global recognition than Cho Young-hee? Some of the things I get are Ban Ki-moon. I said, yes, of course, UN Secretary General. First time United Nations ever had Asian Secretary General. Absolutely. Great global recognition. Other people will say Kim Jong-il. Why? Because of his pursuit of nuclear program and testing of nuclear weapons that have drawn a lot of attention of the world because these things aren't done anymore. But certainly Kim Jong-il or Ban Ki-moon are not teaching about Korea, its history and culture. You can say, oh, what about K-pop artists? It's so popular around the world. Of course it is. But even K-pop artists, they're promoting pop culture. They're not promoting what is Korean culture, Korean history, Korean traditions. So there has never been a person from Korea that has more global recognition. And at the same time, the other side of that coin has done more to promote Korea, its history, its proud traditions and culture and customs all around the world than Choi Young Hee. So that's who Choi Young Hee is, and that's the way the world will eventually uh, recognize him when history settles and this confusion is sorted out. From early on, General Choi was involved in promoting Taekwondo around the world, as you've said. Where did this ambition come from? I think it's best if I told this using his own words. These words obviously go back to his fervent nationalism and deep patriotism. But in his own words, he said, All things are governed by the law of yin and yang. Happiness can often stem from catastrophic moments. My painful experiences of degradation and humiliation when the Japanese colonization of Korea reduced me to a person without a country inspired me to learn Taekwondo. I was further motivated by my desire to preserve and spread the spirit and wisdom of the Korean people to the world. As you discussed earlier, during the 1970s, General Choi left South Korea and went into exile. Why was that, and what role did the politics of the time play in this decision? What role did the politics play? The politics was the role. 1972 was the height of the brutality under the Park Chung-hee regime. If you look at history, you'll see the constitution was suspended yet again, National Parliament was disbanded yet again. He changed the procedures yet again to ensure another term as president of Korea. And it was during 1972 that General Choi secretly told only his wife. He packed up for a trip overseas because he traveled quite often for Taekwondo. So he had a trip scheduled. Apparently, people have been telling him they're coming after you. They're coming after you. So he he knew his uh, safety was in jeopardy. He told only his wife. He packed just the uh, normal things you would take on a brief trip abroad and never came back. As I said, they held his family, his wife, his two daughters, and his only son hostage. Grandmaster Jun Ri, known as the father of American Taekwondo, had a very close student in the Dominican Republic that went to America and met Grandmaster Jun Ri during his college days when Grandmaster Ri was a student there and also teaching martial arts. And when this Dominican student graduated and returned back to his home, he had gotten a good job in the U.S. Embassy. So because of his job and his influence, when Jun Ri took General Choi, they went together to Dominican Republic on a taekwondo trip. They met with the Dominican president, and the Dominican president brokered a deal with the Park Chung hee government to release General Choi's wife and one daughter. South Korea was dispatching people to Canada to talk to General Choi, get him to come home. We'll give you ambassadorship of your choice. They said they even offered him foreign minister if he would come back home. General Choi called their bluff. He, in essence, gave up his family for Taekwondo and refused to go back. And many Korean people, when they hear this, are really then come to understand how obsessed and how deeply passionate General Choi was about his Taekwondo. So the politics played all of this. Prior to the military coup, we know the Sigmund Rhee regime, 
he was a very autocratic leader and his administration became increasingly corrupt until April 1960 when protests throughout the whole country forced him to flee in exile. And I believe he was flown out on an American CIA plane along with his family to Hawaii where he lived the remaining few years of his life. But General Choi, as a member of that party, and had a good relationship with uh, Dr. Ri. So when he left, things were very unstable in Korea, and that necessitated the military coup. So as I had said earlier, General Choi supported the military coup, but when he advised Park Chung-hee, because he considered Park Chung-hee his junior. I don't know if people realize this. Park graduated the second military class. General Choi graduated the first. General Choi's serial number was 44. Park Chung-hee was 166. So General Choi always considered Park Chung-hee his military junior. So he had told General Park, give the country back to civilian leadership, and they didn't do that. And as I mentioned earlier, when he formed the ITF, it was customary in Korean tradition that leading members of society be given honorary titles to help further the organization. So when ITIF was formed, Kim Jong-pil was put in as the honorary president. General Choi supported his candidacy for president. And General Choi became increasingly outspoken against the Park chung hee government. So when he left and now is safely in Canada... His wife and one daughter joins him, and then apparently, we don't know exactly how the son and remaining daughter were allowed out, but the prevailing thought is that since they could not get him to come back, what then do they do with this young boy and young lady? They, in essence, make them orphans. So apparently, they just let them go, and the family was reunited in Canada. Once that happened, and then, of course, the ITF was relocated to Toronto in 1972. But once that happened and his family was out, he really raised the level of his vocal opposition. And again, as a founding member of the army and as a former ambassador and a, a major general, he carried a lot of weight in the opposition. 1972, another opposition candidate, Kim Dae-jung, was snatched in the Sea of Japan, or Koreans would say the EC. And I interviewed the American CIA station chief, not interviewed, I, I spoke to him about this, and, you know, they interceded and saved the Kim Dae-jung. He eventually became president, won the Nobel Peace Prize for his engagement with North Korea. But General Choi was engaging with North Korea since 1979, and I don't think a lot of people realize he was nominated for Nobel Peace Prize. So... That's the, the background of the political situation. And then, of course, since General Choi was considered a problematic leader with his autocratic leadership style, that once he became persona non grata in South Korea, many of his taekwondo opposition people, his detractors, used that where they uh, looked to diminish General Choi's character by spreading these very nasty stories about him. And then, of course, once he went to North Korea, that really sealed his doom. And when General Choi was still in South Korea, General Park took a trip to West Germany. And when he got off the plane, a president of a small country that few people knew about, he's greeted by all these Westerners at the airport holding Korean flags. So he came up and he said, you know, why do you have the flag? And I have, I, have, I have a picture of this. This Westerner said to him, Sir, I am a Taekwondo man. My teacher told me his president's coming here, so I have to come and welcome you. So that was orchestrated by General Choi duk Shin, who was General Choi's sworn blood brother, who was the ambassador to West Germany. And he was very supportive of the Taekwondo efforts. He actually was the one that uh, helped get General Choi to bring the military team to Vietnam and Taiwan back in 59 and to get the support for that goodwill tour in 65. So General Park, very, very smart, very sharp, saw very early on the very powerful tool from a propaganda and cultural standpoint that Taekwondo was. So he gave great amount of support to Taekwondo. But once Dr. Kim Un young came in, and Dr. Kim, very, very talented politician, highly educated, I believe he speaks six languages. Once he came in, at that point, General Choi's power and influence had diminished so much that he was not able to really get any support for his vision. So as he became more and more outspoken, the support diminished, 
and he was forced to flee. Once he was abroad and he really turned up that opposition voice, what the KCI did and the KCI, you know, these things are documented. Many people around the world are very familiar with Watergate, the first scandal that the term gate was attached to. Watergate was a hotel in Washington that uh, the Nixon administration people did some bad things on spying on the opposition party. So ever since Watergate surfaced, every other scandal that hit uh, Washington, D.C. gets gate attached to it. And the very next scandal was Korea Gate. Korea Gate investigation by the FBI, by both houses of Congress, there were hearings on Capitol Hill. And there's extensive reports. I don't know if there's 20 volumes. I went through every single page, 17,000 pages. I don't remember. I went through every single volume. Uh, It confirms the involvement of Taekwondo instructors in these covert and nasty tactics that the KCIA did around the world, not just in the United States. And General Choi objected to this. He did not want a military dictatorship infiltrating his taekwondo and then using it for these types of activities. Now, it's funny because when he went to North Korea, some of the few remaining South Korean masters were forced to leave him because of this. But he would say to them, why are you leaving now? I I took money from the KCIA. I took money from American CIA. Now I take money from North Korea and you're leaving. But once he was in Canada and his opposition voice raised and he was this leading political dissident, the KCIA started to pressure members of the ITF. If you don't leave the ITF, your passport won't be renewed. You won't be allowed back to visit your family. Your family members won't get promotions. They'll get fired. They're in the military. You know, there was a former captain in the Rock Army whose brother was in the military that would not get promoted. Other people, families had jobs. One of the instructors, his father had a job and never got a promotion because of his continued involvement with General Choi. So these things happen all around the world. And little by little, all the South Korean instructors were forced to leave General Choi except for a, a handful. And it was at that time, General Choi then turned to North Korea and introduced Taekwondo there. Now, this is right around 1979, 1980. Again, got to go back to the political scene. October 26, 1979, which ironically, 70 years to the date that Lieutenant General An chung Gun assassinated Hirobu Miito, the first resident governor general of Korea. The KCIA director shot and killed at point-blank range General Park Chung-hee, which again threw the political government stability into chaos. General Choi was in Argentina when news came from the embassy that this has happened. They thought they're finally going to get a chance to go back to South Korea. But we know within a few months, General Chung Doo-wan orchestrated another coup. And, you know, some, some South Koreans look at Park Chung-hee as the father, well, he is the father of the economic miracle, the, the miracle of the Han. Uh, he took South Korea from one of the poorest countries in the world to one of the richest countries in the world in record time. They say South Korea is the only nation to go from a recipient of United Nations aid to a major donor now of United Nations aid. So people revere Park Chung-hee. But the other side of that coin was his human rights record. And I guess if you suffered like General Choi did at his hand, it really didn't matter the economic situation because you now suffered personally. And on the flip side, if you weren't being impacted personally by these measures that some Koreans say were necessary because of the situation of the divided peninsula and the constant threat of another communist invasion. So if you weren't personally affected by that, really all you care about is economics because you go from such a poor country to such an affluent country. He's revered. But I don't think many people have that same feeling for Chung Doo-wan because when he took over, my teacher's own town, the Kwangju Massacre, I remember General Choi telling me, he's a murderous butcher. And we asked him, oh, how could you say it? He goes, that's not my words. That's a quote from the New York Times. They don't know how many people were uh, literally extinguished during that massacre. So these are very turbulent political times in Korea. So the plan was for General Choi to go back to Korea, both parts of the Korean Peninsula, South Korea and North Korea. South Korea did not let him in. So he went to North Korea, went to North Korea only. Some of the pioneers that were willing to go both said, sir, we can't go if you just go to the North. And they backed out. But that's how the politics really 
impacted Taekwondo. So now he goes to North Korea, and it's another political dynamic. Now he's actually in the other half of Korea, and what is he doing? He's gaining support from them. They now start teaching ITF Taekwondo there. They start dispatching Korean instructors all around the world to teach Taekwondo to the parts of the world where they have diplomatic relations. And in those days, what are we talking about? Red China, Soviet Union, the Soviet bloc, Eastern Europe, the other communist non-aligned countries. These are the same countries that South Korea had no diplomatic relations with. So it was actually the ITF through the support of North Korea that introduced Taekwondo to these countries, which was General Choi's vision. Go to the Eastern Bloc. And they were doing that in the 70s. They were introducing Taekwondo there. And General Choi is labeled a communist sympathizer because he's going to these places in Eastern Europe. But in 1977, the third world championships of WTF was hosted in my country in Chicago, Illinois. I have spoken to people from the former Eastern Bloc countries. Their expenses were actually paid to go to the WTF World Championship. So who is the communist sympathizers? People paying communist people to come to Chicago or General Choi going with his own money, which he had little of, through the ITF to introduce Taekwondo to these places around the world. So I laugh when people started pointing to him as a communist sympathizer because it was actually the other side that was actually funneling money into these communist countries. And why did they do it? Quite simply, the goal was to get Taekwondo into the Olympics. How do you get Taekwondo into the Olympics? If a significant portion of the world, these communist and socialist and non-aligned countries, don't have Taekwondo in it. The West had it, all through the efforts of General Choi, and then, of course, from the WTF. Now that North Korea is participating in ITF Taekwondo, they start lobbying, and they get support from Cuba and the Soviet Union to get the original Taekwondo in the Olympics, which caused a big problem, because now the IOC has two major groups trying to get in with Taekwondo. So in many, many ways, these politics, Taekwondo politics, cross-organizational rivalry, and those politics, and the politics of a divided country. Remember the Cold War era. The Cold War went hot first, where? On the Korean Peninsula. And I'll end this by using General Choi's own words again. My obsession with Taekwondo further led me to stand firm against the desire of corrupt government officials who wanted to use Taekwondo as a political instrument to strengthen their dictatorship. My outspoken criticism of the South Korean government, both then and now, has been frequently misinterpreted, making me appear as an enemy of my own people. As someone that knew Choi Hyung-hee, he was not an enemy of his own people. He was a fervent Korean national that was passionate about having his divided homeland reunited. It's sad that the politics caused by this traumatic situation of Korea being divided by through no choice of their own and not by Korean people, has infected the telling of the history of Taekwondo, which then prevents crediting the people like General Trey, not just General Trey. There are countless numbers of people that are literally written out of history, blacklisted or even worse, because of this ugly political nastiness. And I'm hoping in 2016 that will start to change. So how was General Trey received in North Korea? General Choi was received as a hero, and I'm sure for propaganda purposes up there. But, you know, he went there at great risk because he was, after all, an opposing general in a war that never ended. It was during the height of the Cold War. And as we said before, the Cold War first went hot in Korea. And that Korean Civil War was devastating. So who knew what would happen when he arrived and brought Taekwondo there? what would be his future. But he was embraced there. And in General Choi's own words, he says he was looked at there as a teacher. Because what he did, he, he introduced Taekwondo there and would go there quite often to teach. And some of his students were then dispatched around the world and they were part of this effort to continue the global dissemination of his art of Taekwondo. Taekwondo is very popular there. I think sports are important because it helps uh, serve their national interests. And these instructors that have been dispatched around the world have now moved up in the hierarchy, and some have some senior leadership roles. So it's 
quite ironic that you know North Korea embraced General Choi's original Taekwondo because the original Taekwondo was first developed in the South Korean military. And uh, as we know, since there is not many Western influences in the northern half of this divided peninsula, many traditions are kept alive and well in that part including the original Taekwondo. Because remember, our patterns, or pumse are all named after great Korean patriotic figures in their history or significant events throughout Korea's history. So it's quite ironic that they actually embrace his Taekwondo. But they did, as General Choi say, they looked at him as a teacher. In 2002, General Choi died in Pyongyang, the North Korean capital. Did his loyalty shift from South Korea to North Korea over the preceding decades? Uh, This is a very sensitive and and important question, uh, but one that needs great attention. It just has a false starting point, the the premise I reject initially, because as I said, General Choi only looked at himself as a Korean. It's very important for the world to know that he was a Canadian citizen, a highly decorated Canadian citizen. They nominated him for the Nobel Peace Prize. Their embassy here in Seoul, the Canadian embassy in Seoul, they have a gym they named the gym after Choi Hung Hee. So Canada in South Korea recognized the importance of General Choi. They also gave him some very high prestigious civilian award. So General Choi was not anything but a fervent Korean national. So people think that he went back to North Korea to die. They don't understand the situation, the story. General Choi was a founding member of the Korean army. He rose to the level of two-star major general. He was the first Korean ambassador to Malaysia. He was instrumental in the developing period of South Korea. He made application to South Korea to be buried in South Korea. He was dying, his illness was terminal, and he made application to South Korea. Grandma Se Jung Woo Jin has in his possession, an answer to their letter with the official stamp from the Korean ministry that denied his request, his wish to be buried in South Korea. General Choi said that since he was such a fervent Korean, he wanted to be buried in Korean soil. He wanted his remains placed in the dirt of his homeland. When South Korea said no, North Korea said yes. North Korea said they would give him a state funeral, which they did, and that they would bury him in a national cemetery for patriots. Although I don't have the capacity to predict what the future will be, I can say with certainty, in the future, Korea will be one again. So where General Choi is buried in Korea, the exact location on what latitude that he is, it will be insignificant when Korea is won again. So I don't believe his loyalty shifted at all because his loyalty was always to Korea. I have a quote here from General Choi, and the quote is, In summation, my life has been a turbulent one, riddled with lonely fights and unfortunate adventure that few would envy. A life of self-exiled, thousands of miles distance from my beloved country. Even so, it has truly been a worthwhile endeavor. My dream has at last been realized. The ultimate fantasy of spreading and teaching Taekwondo with no regard to considerations of religion, ideology, national boundaries, or race. I can say without hesitation that I am the happiest man alive. That was what he was loyal to. Let us jump back to the present day. According to the WTF, the World Taekwondo Federation, some 70 million people practice Taekwondo around the world. How did a martial art that originated in a once small and obscure country become so popular? Two words, crazy people. The history of the world is filled with examples of uh, people that others thought were crazy because of their ambitions, their dreams, their visions. And we just filled with so many examples. So who were some of these crazies? Uh, General Choi was one of them. Another one was the tremendous support that Dr. Kim Moon Young was able to give to Taekwondo to get it to Olympic sport. Once a sport comes into the Olympics, as we said, so many benefits come through sponsorship and attention. It's everybody's dream, these young athletes, oh, to be in the Olympics, it's the pinnacle. So these two people, Cho Hyung Hee and Kim Moon Young, and then they each have teams under them. I, I like to say the first three masters of Taekwondo, General Choi Young Hee, Colonel Nam Tae Hee, and Sergeant First Class Han Cha Kyo. They were the first people teaching Taekwondo. 
that team was joined by a corporal Kim Jong Chan, who is known as JC Kim, and then a master sergeant Kim Bak Man. So on the ITF side, these are instrumental people that have been ignored by history. And on the WTF side, under Dr. Kim Won Young's savvy political leadership, you had the martial artists uh, Lee Chung Woo, Lee Nam Suk, Am Young Gu, both Grandmaster J C Kim and Kim Bak Man still alive. These four people are still alive. Uh, they could be considered crazy with their devotion and dedication to Taekwondo. But it's people like that, Korean people like them, that actually traveled the world and started spreading this. And then what were they spreading? They were spreading something that so positively impacted people's lives. How could it not grow to be so popular? Looking at Taekwondo in an Olympic discipline, it is interesting to notice that North Korea participated in all Summer Olympics since 1992, yet never in Taekwondo. What's the reason for this absence? Easy answer. Very simply, North Korea is not a member nation of the WTF, so therefore they just cannot compete in the Olympics. Now, we go back to that concept, the 206 countries and the one. So North Korea has decided not, even though the WTF would like them to become a member nation, they have not become a member nation. As we discussed before, the ITF had always tried to get into the Olympics, and North Korea was very supportive in those efforts, as were other Eastern European and Soviet bloc countries early on. Now that the Iron Curtain has fallen, the push to get ITF Taekwondo into the Olympics is really limited to one country, and that's North Korea. So I cannot speak for North Korea. I can only guess that by examining history and knowing that they are very much engaged currently with the WTF and IOC to get into the Olympics, it may be counterproductive for them to actually become a member of the WTF, because that may weaken their negotiating hand. Because Under the IOC, the ITF is in the Olympics, but they must go in the Olympics under the WTF umbrella. The WTF is the only international federation for Taekwondo, so there cannot be two federations. So right now, the agreement was made for ITF athletes to be permitted to access this process. The exact details of how that's going to be worked out has not been finalized yet. But what the ITF is looking to do is not compete under the WTF umbrella with their rules, but to come in under the WTF umbrella with a separate event for ITF Taekwondo. Wrestling has it already, Greco-Roman style wrestling, freestyle wrestling. And that is something that uh, will probably be happening in 2020. Uh, I believe the host city Tokyo is going to introduce some sports and they may be the ones, it's, it's a question of logistics and raising the player cap and financing that. But I believe what the negotiations are is to be able to make that happen so that we can have an ITF event in addition to the WTF event. But those are the things that are still being worked out now. And speaking of this whole effort, Professor Chang Lung, who is the person towards General Choi's end of his life, he's an IOC member from North Korea, that took over the leadership of one of the ITFs. And the political reality is that it is the fact that ITF is supported by North Korea and that Taekwondo is practiced throughout North Korea that is the attraction for the IOC to use that as a vehicle as their version of a soft diplomatic tool using the sport of Taekwondo to bring these two halves of divided Korea together. And I think that's why we see the current hands-on involvement of President Thomas Bach and his predecessor, Jack Roge. You were the first to bring a group of North Korean Taekwondo performers on a trip to the United States. When and in what context did this happen and would it still be possible today? As you know, Back in 1989, I led the American team, first time that Americans ever competed in North Korea with Taekwondo. And at that time, I went over to General Choi with my friend from Lebanon. Back in the late 80s, there was all the problems with the Marine barracks in Beirut. And we went to General Choi, we said, we become best friends through Taekwondo, even though the relations between our countries are so strained. And he said, that's exactly why I spread Taekwondo around the world. That's my dream. That's my goal. And he says, now that there's an American team in North Korea, we must have North Korean team go to the United States. Now, there's no way I could have done that. Grandmaster Jung Woo Jin is the one that has taken over that 
mantle from General Choi. That responsibility has been passed on to him. And it was Grandma Sejong that started engaging. In, in the early 90s, he almost had a team from South Korea, a team from North Korea, tour the United States. But from what we understand, some Taekwondo entities in South Korea prevented that from happening. But in 2007, he was successful in bringing over a team from North Korea that literally went from the west coast of the Pacific Ocean to the east coast, the Atlantic Ocean. They saw, and I accompanied them the whole way, I even saw parts of my country that I didn't experience before. That was in 2007. That was replicated in 2011 when we focus in the New England Northeast region. There are some talks to do it again maybe this year, but these kind of things always depend on the political climate between the two Koreas and, of course, from Korea and America because uh, since Grandma Sejong and myself are not government people, we have no authority to issue visas. So the visa process is impacted by the events on the Korean Peninsula. So we look for available windows of opportunity, and we were going to do one last year where we were going to actually go through the DMZ with Taekwondo people from the South, and we had all indication from both halves of Korea and from the State Department in Washington that this would be good. But this is very hard to do because any one of the parties can say yes and then no, it's not going to happen and they can blame it on the UN or on another party. So it's difficult to do. We are persevering because that's what Taekwondo teaches us to do. But there is some interest in doing a, a third goodwill tour of the United States this year. In this tradition, you seem keen on bridging North Korea and the outside world through Taekwondo. Do you have any other initiatives in the works? My major initiative, my chief goal is to correct the history of Taekwondo. It's not to tell the ITF side, not to tell the WTF side, but to tell what actually happened, what transpired, who made it transpire. That is the initiative that I focus on mostly because in that way, I think I can contribute to healing some of the rifts in the Taekwondo community because when we understand our common roots, when we actually come to realize how much we share, It's so much more than that what separates us. And the strange thing, the ironic thing, the really great thing is the things that separate us are wonderful learning opportunities. I can learn something from a WTF person, and hopefully a WTF person can learn something from me, and we as Taekwondo martial artists can improve. So that is my main goal, and I hope to see more and more progress, and that's one of the reasons why I believe this opportunity here may help facilitate that. So I'm, I'm very much appreciative of that. To conclude, in your opinion, will Taekwondo keep increasing in popularity, or has it already reached its peak? How do you see the discipline changing during the next few decades? Critically, if Taekwondo remains in the Olympics, it will get the attention and funding that will help ensure its popularity. If it does not remain in the Olympics and it faces fierce competition, not only from other martial arts like karate and wushu, but other sports like baseball, softball, baseball, softball combine their efforts. There's no longer an international baseball federation and international softball federation. There's an international baseball slash softball federation. So it goes back to that theme. WTF Taekwondo, ITF Taekwondo under the WTF umbrella. We don't have to merge with WTF. We just have to go in under their umbrella with an additional event. So that will be critical to keeping Taekwondo's popularity up. I see the WTF introducing new concepts with their demonstrations. They're very flashy with music and other visuals there. They're moving towards some kind of uh, thing that's becoming popular with the younger generation in Korea, uh, incorporating dance and music into Taekwondo. Uh, So I don't know because I like to consider myself a traditional martial artist. So I think what another thing that will help Taekwondo's growth in the future impact its future will be getting back to the roots of Taekwondo as a self-defense and incorporating the latest advances in these other martial arts to get back to what, remember what I said in the military, was a consolidation of the martial arts. So if you're self-defense based, it doesn't matter where techniques come from. All it matters is that you've taken these techniques, they become weapons in your personal arsenal. You currently hold the 8th Dan, or black belt in Taekwondo, the second highest rank. What do you see for your own future in Taekwondo? Possibly 
an advance to the highest rank? Well, for me personally, it would be a great honor to achieve the terminal degree of Taekwondo, which is ninth degree. So I would be honored if my seniors thought I was worthy of ninth degree. The timeline for that would be in 2017. And according, again, according to General Choi, you know, he was such a deep thinker. There is a process in place to evaluate whether a prospective candidate for ninth degree can earn the title of Grand Master because when we say student oath, there's a student oath in Taekwondo, it ends with, I shall build a more peaceful world. Since the ultimate goal of Taekwondo is to build a more peaceful world, a Grand Master, the highest level, their responsibility is for promoting world peace. So a prospective candidate's background is scrutinized to see if they have the attitude, the character, the traits that will afford them the ability to be in a position to further that goal. So when that time comes, if they evaluate me and determine that I've earned that, I will try my best to continue to work as hard as I can with Taekwondo because the way we started is by saying how such a great gift it is. And I was brought up when somebody shares a gift with you, you give back to them. So that's my a goal that I looked someday to be honored with achieving. Dr. George Vitelli, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank uh, Korea and the world for this opportunity because Korea has really given the entire world a great gift. And maybe now people tuning into this interview can gain a little bit more insight into this great gift. And the researching and telling of Taekwondo's history is far from complete. And if anybody listening can think of anything to add or any mistakes that I've made in any way to contribute with crediting these people who so very well deserve it, please reach out for me because my goal is to get at who did what and where and when they did it. So I uh, appreciate the, the time afforded to me and, uh, and I thank you again. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.